Welcome to this compilation of five grim and gritty science fiction short stories. I'll be narrating Competition by James Causey, A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Leiber, What Shall It Profit by Paul Anderson, Road Stop by David Mason, and Dark Dawn by Henry Kuttner. If you find yourself enjoying the stories, you can support me as a narrator by hitting the like button, subscribing, and signing up to my Patreon. There you'll get access to exclusive novelettes every month, early access to full novels I narrate, and ad-free audio and video versions of all stories. Head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff if you're interested. But let's get to the stories, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Competition by James Causey Narrated by William Skye They would learn what caused the murderous disease, if it was the last thing they did. Greta January 18th, Earth Time I wish Max would treat me like a woman. An hour ago, at dinner, John Armitage proposed a toast, especially for my benefit. He loves to play the gallant. Big man, silver mane, very blue eyes, a porcelain smile. The head of WSC, the perfect example of the politician scientist. To the colony, he announced, raising his glass. May Epsilon love them and keep them. May it only be transmittal trouble. Amen, Max said. We drank. Taylor Bishop put down his glass precisely. Bishop is a grey little man with a diffident voice that belies his reputation as the best biochemist in the system. Has Farragut hinted otherwise? he asked mildly. Armitage frowned. It would be scarcely prudent for Senator Farragut to alarm the populace with disaster rumours. Bishop looked at him out of his pale eyes. Besides, it's an election year. The silence was suddenly ugly. Then Armitage chuckled. All right, he said. So the senator wants to be a national hero. The fact still remains that Epsilon had better be habitable, or Pan-Asia will scream we're hogging it. They want war anyway. Within a month, boom. For a moment I was afraid he was going to make a speech about Earth's suffocating billions, the screaming tension of the Cold War, and the sacred necessity of our mission. If he had, I'd have gotten the weeping shrieks. Some responsibilities are too great to think about. But instead, he winked at me. For the first time, I began to realize why Armitage was the director of the Scientists' World Council. Hypothesis, Greta, he said. Epsilon is probably a paradise. Why should the test colony let the rest of the world in on it? They're being selfish. I giggled. We relaxed. After supper, Armitage played chess with Bishop, while I followed Max into the control room. Soon, I said. Planet fall in eighteen hours, Doctor. He said it stiffly, busying himself at the controls. Max is a small, dark man with angry eyes and the saddest mouth I've ever seen. He is also a fine pilot and magnificent bacteriologist. I wanted to slap him. I hate these professional British types that think a female biochemist is some sort of freak. Honestly, I said, what do you think? Disease, he said bitterly. For the first six months they reported on schedule, remember? A fine, clean planet, no dominant life forms, perfect for immigration, unique, one world in a billion. Abruptly they stopped sending. You figure it. I thought about it. I read your thematic on Venusian viruses, he said abruptly. Good show. You should be an asset to us, Doctor. Thanks, I snapped. I was so furious that I inadvertently looked into the cabin viewplate. Bishop had warned me. It takes years of deep space time to enable a person to stare at the naked universe without screaming. It got me. The crystal thunder of the stars, that horrible hungry blackness. I remember I was sort of crying and fighting, then Max had me by the shoulders holding me gently. He was murmuring and stroking my hair. After a time, I stopped whimpering. Thanks, I whispered. You'd better get some sleep, Greta, he said. I turned in. I think I'm falling in love. January 19th. Today we made Planetfall. 
It took Max a few hours to home in on the test colony ship. He finally found it on the shore of an inland sea that gleamed like wrinkled blue satin. For a time we cruised in widening spirals trying to detect some signs of life. There was nothing. We finally landed. Max and Armitage donned spacesuits and went toward the colony ship. They came back in a few hours, very pale. They're dead, Armitage's voice cracked as he came out of the airlock. All of them. Skeletons, Max said. How? Bishop said. Armitage's hands were shaking as he poured a drink. Looks like civil war. But there were a hundred of them, I whispered. They were dedicated. I wonder, Bishop said thoughtfully. White and brown and yellow. Russian and British and French and German and Chinese and Spanish. They were chosen for technical background rather than emotional stability. Rot, Armitage said like drums beating. It's some alien bug, some toxin. We've got to isolate it. Find an antibody. He went to work. January 22nd. I'm scared. It's taken three days to finalize the atmospheric tests. Oxygen, nitrogen, helium, with trace gases. Those trace gases are stinkers. Bishop discovered a new inert gas, heavier than xenon. He's excited. I'm currently checking stuff that looks like residual organic, and I'm not too happy about it. Still, this atmosphere seems pure. Armitage is chafing. It's in the flora, he insisted today. Something, perhaps, that they ate. He stood with a strained tautness, staring feverishly at the chronometer. Senator Farragut's due to make contact soon. What'll I tell him? That we're working on it, Bishop said dryly. That the four best scientists in the galaxy are working toward the solution. That's good, Armitage said seriously. But they'll worry. You are making progress. I wanted to wrap a pestle around his neck. We were all in the control room an hour later. Armitage practically stood at attention while Farragut's voice boomed from the transmitter. It was very emetic. The senator said the entire hemisphere was waiting for us to announce the planet was safe for immigration. He said the stars were a challenge to man. He spoke fearfully of the coming world crisis. Epsilon was man's last chance for survival. Armitage assured him our progress was satisfactory, that within a few days we would have something tangible to report. The senator said we were heroes. Finally, it was over. Max yawned. Wonder how many voters start field work at once? Armitage frowned. It's not funny, Sison. Not funny at all. Inasmuch as we've checked out the atmosphere, I suggest we start field work at once. Taylor blinked. We're still testing a few residual. I happen to be nominal leader of this party. Armitage stood very tall, very determined. Obviously the atmosphere is pure. Let's make some progress. February 2nd. This is progress? For the past ten days we've worked the clock around. Quantitative analysis, soil, water, flora, fauna, cellular, microscopic. Nothing. Max has discovered a few lethal alkaloids in some greenish tree fungus, but I doubt if the colony were indiscriminate fungus eaters. Bishop has found a few new unicellular types, but nothing dangerous. There's one tentacle thing that reminds me of a frightened rotifer. Max named it Armitagium. Armitage is pleased. Perhaps the fate of the hundred colonists will remain one of those forever unsolved mysteries, like the fate of the Mary Celeste or the starship Prometheus. This planet's clean. February 4th. Today Max and I went specimen hunting. It must be autumn on Epsilon. Everywhere the trees are a riot of scarlet and ochre, the scrubby bushes are shedding their leaves. Once we came upon a field of thistle-like plants with spiny seed pods that opened as we watched, the purple spores drifting afield in an eddy of tinted mist. Max said it reminded him of Scotland. He kissed me. On the way back to the ship we saw two skeletons. Each had its fingers tightly locked about the other's throat. February 20th. 
We have, to date, analysed 900 types of plant life for toxin content. Bishop has tested innumerable spores and bacteria. Our slide file is immense and still growing. Max has captured several insects. There is one tiny yellow bush spider with a killing bite, but the species seem to be rare. Bishop has isolated a mould bacterium that could cause a high fever, but its propagation rate is far too low to enable it to last long in the bloodstream. The most dangerous animal seems to be a two-foot-tall arthropod. They're rare and peaceable. Bishop vivisected one yesterday and found nothing alarming. Last night I dreamed about the first expedition. I dreamed they all committed suicide because Epsilon was too good for them. This is ridiculous. We're working in a sort of quiet madness, getting no closer to the solution. Armitage talked to Senator Farragut yesterday and hinted darkly that the first ship's hydroponic system went haywire and that an improper carbohydrate imbalance killed the colony. Pretty thin. Farragut's getting impatient. Bishop looks haggard. Max looks grim. February 23rd. Our quantitative tests are slowing down. We play a rubber of bridge each night before retiring. Last night I trumped Max's ace and he snarled at me. We had a fight. This morning I found a bouquet of purple spore thistles at my cabin door. Max is sweet. This afternoon, by mutual consent, we all knocked off work and played bridge. Bishop noticed the thistle bouquet in a vase over the chronometer. He objected. They're harmless, Max said. Besides, they smell nice. I can hardly wait for tomorrow's rubber. Our work is important, but one does need relaxation. February 25th. Armitage is cheating. Yesterday he failed to score one of my overtricks. We argued bitterly about it. Taylor, of course, sided with him. Three hands later, Armitage got the bid in hearts. One hundred and fifty honours, he announced. That's a lie, I said. It was only a hundred, he grinned, but thank you, Greta. Now I shan't try the Queen finesse. No wonder they've won the last three evenings. Max is furious with them both. February 28th. We played all day. Max and I kept losing. I always knew Armitage was a pompous toad, but I never realised he was slimy. This afternoon it was game all, and Armitage overcalled my diamond opener with three spades. Bishop took him to four, and I doubled, counting on my ace king of hearts and diamonds. I led out my diamond ace, and Armitage trumped from his hand. Bishop laid down his dummy. He had clubs and spades solid, with doubleton hearts and diamonds. None? Max asked Armitage dangerously. Armitage tittered. I wanted to scratch his eyes out. He drew Trump immediately and set up clubs on board, dumping the heart losers from his hand and finally sloughing two diamonds. Made seven, he said complacently. Less two for the diamond reneg makes five. One over trick doubled. We were vulnerable, so it's game and rubber. I gasped. You reneged deliberately? Certainly. Double turn in hearts and diamonds in my hand. If you get in, I'm down one. As it was, I made an overtrick. The only penalty for a reneg is two tricks. The rule book does not differentiate between deliberate and accidental renegs. Sorry. I stared at his florid throat, at his jugular. I could feel my mouth twitching. On the next hand, I was dummy. I excused myself and went into the lab. I found a scalpel. I came up quietly behind Armitage, and Bishop saw what I was going to do, and shouted, and I was not nearly fast enough. Armitage ducked, and Bishop tackled me. Thanks, dear, Max said thoughtfully, looking at the cards scattered on the floor. We would have been set one trick. Club finesse fails. She's crazy, Armitage's mouth worked. The strain's too much for her. I cried. I apologized hysterically. After a while, I convinced them I was all right. Max gave me a sedative. We did not play any more bridge. Over supper, I kept staring at Armitage's throat. After eating, I went for a long walk. When I got back to the ship, everyone was sleeping. March 1st. Bishop found Armitage this morning in his cabin. 
He came out very pale, staring at me. You bitch, he said. Ear to ear. Now what'll I do for a partner? You can't prove it, I said. We'll have to confine her to quarters, Max said wearily. I'll tell Farragut. And let him know the expedition is failing? Max sighed. You're right. We'll tell them Armitage had an accident. I said seriously. It was obviously suicide. His mind snapped. Oh, God, Max said. They buried Armitage this afternoon. From my cabin, I watched them dig the grave. Cheetahs never prosper. March 2nd. Max talked with Senator Farragut this morning. He said Armitage had died a hero's death. Farragut sounds worried. The Pan-Asians have withdrawn their embassy from Imperial Africa. Tension is mounting on the home front. Immigration must start this week. Max was very reassuring. Just a few final tests, Senator. We want to make sure. We puttered in our laboratories all afternoon. Bishop seemed bored. After dinner, he suggested three-handed bridge, and Max said he knew a better game, a friendly game his grandmother had taught him. Hearts. March 5th. It's a plot. All day long, Bishop and Max have managed to give me the Queen of Spades. It's deliberate, of course. Three times I've tried for the moon, and Bishop has held out one damned little heart at the end. Once, Max was slightly ahead on points, and Bishop demanded to see the score. I thought for a moment they would come to blows, but Bishop apologised. It's just that I hate to lose, he said. Quite, Max said. When we finally turned in, Bishop was ahead on points. Too far ahead. March 6th. I suppose it's Bishop's laugh. It has a peculiar horse-like stridency that makes me want to tear out his throat. Twice today I've broken down and cried when he made a jackpot. I'm not going to cry any more. Supper was the usual, beef yeast and vita ale. I remember setting Bishop's plate in front of him and the way his pale eyes gleamed between mouthfuls. Three thousand points ahead, he gloated. You'll never catch me now. Never. Never. That was when he gripped his throat and began writhing on the floor. Max felt his pulse. He stared at me. Very nice, he said. Quick. Did you use a derivative of that green fungus? I said nothing. Max's nostrils were white and pinched. Must I make an autopsy? Why bother, I said. It's obviously heart failure. Yes, why bother, he said. He looked tired. Stay in your cabin, Greta. I'll bring your meals. I don't trust you. His laughter had a touch of madness. March 10th. Max unlocked my cabin door this morning. He looked drawn. Listen, he said. I've checked my respiration, pulse, saliva, temperature. All normal. So? Come here, he said. I followed him into the lab. He indicated a microscope. His eyes were bright. Well? A drop of my blood, he said. Look. I squinted into the microscope. I saw purple discs. Oddly, they did not attack the red blood cells. There was no fission, no mitosis. The leukocytes, strangely enough, let them alone. My hands were shaking as I took a sterile slide and pricked my finger. I put the slide under the microscope. I adjusted the lens and stared. Purple discs, swimming in my bloodstream, thriving, minding their own business. Me too, I said. They're inert, Max said hoarsely. They don't affect metabolism, cause fever, or interfere with the body chemistry in any way. Do they remind you of anything? I thought about it. Then I went to the slide file that was marked Flora Negative. Right, Max said. The purple thistle. Spores. The atmosphere is clogged with them. Greta, my sweet, we're infected. I feel fine, I said. All day long we ran tests. Negative tests. We seem to be disgustingly healthy. Symbiosis, Max said finally. Live and let live. Apparently we're hosts. Only one thing disturbs me. Most symbiotes do something for their host. Something to enhance the host's survival potential. 
We played chess this evening. I won. Max is furious. He's such a poor sport. March 11th. Max talked with Senator Farragut this morning. He gave Epsilon a clean bill of health and the Senator thanked God. The first starship will leave tonight, the Senator said. Right on schedule with 10,000 colonists aboard. You're world heroes! Max and I played chess the rest of the day. Max won consistently. He utilizes a fianchetto that is utterly impregnable. If he wins tomorrow, I shall have to kill him. Max. March 13th. It was, of course, necessary for me to destroy Armitage and Bishop. They won far too often. But I am sorry about Greta. Yet I had to strangle her. If she hadn't started that infernal Queen's pawn opening, it would have been different. She beat me six times running, and on the last game I pulled a superb orangutan, but it was too late. She saw mate in four and gave me that serpent smirk I know so well. How could I have ever been in love with her? March 14th. Frightfully boring to be alone. I have a thought. Chess. Right hand against left. White and black. Jolly good. March 16th. I haven't much time. Left was black this morning, and I beat him four out of five. We're in the lab now. He's watching me scribble this. His thumb and forefinger are twitching in fury. He looks like some great white spider about to spring. He sees the scalpel by the microscope. Now his fingers are inching toward it. Treacherous beast. I'm stronger. If he tries to amputate... A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Leiber Narrated by William Skye Don't wait to get them while they're hot. By then it is too late to get them of all. The big bright doors of the office building parted with a pneumatic whoosh and Roby glided onto Times Square. The crowd that had been watching the fifty-foot-tall girl on the clothing billboard get dressed or reading the latest news about the hot truce scrawl itself in yard-high script, hurried to look. Roby was still a novelty. Roby was fun. For a little while yet he could steal the show. But the attention did not make Roby proud. He had no more emotions than the pink plastic giantess, who dressed and undressed endlessly whether there was a crowd or the street was empty, and who never once blinked her blue mechanical eyes. But she merely drew business, while Roby went out after it. For Roby was the logical conclusion of the development of vending machines. All the earlier ones had stood in one place, on a floor or hanging on a wall, and blankly delivered merchandise in return for coins, whereas Roby searched for customers. He was the demonstration model of a line of sales robots to be manufactured by Schuler vending machines, provided the public invested enough in stocks to give the company capital to go into mass production. The publicity Roby drew stimulated investments handsomely. It was amusing to see the TV and newspaper coverage of Roby selling, but not a fraction as much fun as being approached personally by him. Those who were usually bought anywhere from one to five hundred shares, if they had any money and foresight enough to see that sales robots would eventually be on every street and highway in the country. Roby radared the crowd, found that it surrounded him solidly, and stopped. With a careful built-in sense of timing, he waited for the tension and expectation to mount before he began talking. "'Say, Ma, he doesn't look like a robot at all,' a child said. "'He looks like a turtle!' Which was not completely inaccurate. The lower part of Roby's body was a metal hemisphere hemmed with sponge rubber and not quite touching the sidewalk. The upper was a metal box with black holes in it. The box could swivel and duck a chromium-bright hoop skirt with a turret on top. "'Reminds me too much of the little Joe Paratanks,' a legless veteran of the Persian War muttered, and rapidly rolled himself away on wheels rather like Roby's. His departure made it easier for some of those who knew about Roby to open a path in the crowd. Roby headed straight for the gap. The crowd whooped. Roby glided very slowly down the path, 
deftly jogging aside whenever he got too close to ankles in Skylon or Socassins. The rubber buffer on his hoop skirt was merely an added safeguard. The boy who had called Roby a turtle jumped in the middle of the path and stood his ground, grinning foxily. Roby stopped two feet short of him. The turret ducked. The crowd got quiet. Hello, youngster, Roby said in a voice that was smooth as that of a TV star and was in fact a recording of one. The boy stopped smiling. Hello, he whispered. How old are you? Roby asked. Nine. No, eight. That's nice, Roby observed. A metal arm shot down from his neck, stopped just short of the boy. The boy jerked back. For you, Roby said. The boy gingerly took the red polylop from the neatly fashioned blunt metal claws and began to unwrap it. Nothing to say? asked Roby. Uh, thank you. After a suitable pause, Roby continued. And how about a nice refreshing drink of Poppy Pop to go with your polylop? The boy lifted his eyes but didn't stop licking the candy. Roby waggled his claws slightly. Just give me a quarter, and within five seconds... A little girl wriggled out of the forest of legs. Give me a polylop too, Roby, she demanded. Rita, come back here, a woman in the third rank of the crowd called angrily. Roby scanned the newcomer gravely. His reference silhouettes were not good enough to let him distinguish the sex of children, so he merely repeated, Hello, youngster. Rita, give me a polylop. Disregarding both remarks, for a good salesman is single-minded and does not waste bait, Roby said winningly, I'll bet you read Junior Space Killers. Now I have here. Uh-huh. I'm a girl. He got a polylop. At the word girl, Roby broke off. Rather ponderously, he said, I'll bet you read G.G. Jones, Space Stripper. Now I have here the latest issue of that thrilling comic, not yet in the stationary vending machines. Just give me fifty cents and within five... Please let me through, I'm her mother. A young woman in the front rank drawled over her powder-sprayed shoulder. I'll get her for you, and slithered out on six-inch platform shoes. Run away, children, she said nonchalantly. Lifting her arms behind her head, she pirouetted slowly before Roby, to show how much she did for her bolero half-jacket and her form-fitting slacks that melted into Skylon just above the knees. The little girl glared at her. She ended the pirouette in profile. At this age level, Roby's reference silhouettes permitted him to distinguish sex, though with occasional amusing and embarrassing miscalls. He whistled admiringly. The crowd cheered. Someone remarked critically to a friend, It would go over better if he was built more like a real robot. You know, like a man. The friend shook his head. This way it's subtler. No one in the crowd was watching the new script overhead, as it scribbled, Ice pack for hot truce? Vanadin hints Russ may yield on Pakistan. Roby was saying, In the savage new glamour tint we have christened Mars Blood, complete with spray applicator and fit all finger stores that mask each finger completely except for the nail. Just give me five dollars. Uncrumpled bills may be fed into the revolving rollers you see beside my arm. And within five seconds... No thanks, Roby, the young woman yawned. Remember, Roby persisted, for three more weeks, seductivizing Mars blood will be unobtainable from any other robot or human vendor. No, thanks. Roby scanned the crowd resourcefully. Is there any gentleman here? He began, just as a woman elbowed her way through the front rank. I told you to come back, she snapped at the little girl. But I didn't get my polylop. Who would care to? Rita! Roby cheated. Ow! Meanwhile, the young woman in the half-bolero had scanned the nearby gentleman on her own. Deciding that there was less than a 50% chance of any of them accepting the proposition Roby seemed about to make, she took advantage of the scuffle to slither gracefully back into the ranks. Once again, the path was clear before Roby. He paused, however, for a brief recapitulation of the more magical properties of Mars Blood, including a telling phrase about the passionate claws of a Martian sunrise. But no one bought. It wasn't quite time. Soon enough, silver coins would be clinking, bills going through the rollers faster than laundry, and 500 people struggling for the privilege of having their money taken away from them by America's first mobile sales robot. But there were still some tricks that Roby had to do free, and one certainly should enjoy those before starting the more expensive fun. So Roby moved on until he reached the curb. The variation in level was instantly sensed by his underscanners. He stopped. 
His head began to swivel. The crowd watched in eager silence. This was Roby's best trick. Roby's head stopped swivelling. His scanners had found the traffic light. It was green. Roby edged forward. But then the light turned red. Roby stopped again, still on the curb. The crowd softly ahed its delight. It was wonderful to be alive and watching Roby on such an exciting day. Alive and amused in the fresh, weather-controlled air between the lines of bright skyscrapers with their winking windows, and under a sky so blue you could almost call it dark. But way, way up where the crowd could not see, the sky was darker still. Purple dark, with stars showing. And in that purple dark, a silver-green something, the colour of a bud, plunged down at better than three miles a second. The silver-green was a newly developed paint that foiled radar. Roby was saying, While we wait for the light, there's time for you youngsters to enjoy a nice refreshing poppy pop. Or for you adults, only those over five feet tall are eligible to buy, to enjoy an exciting poppy pop fizz. Just give me a quarter, or in the case of adults, one dollar and a quarter. I'm licensed to dispense intoxicating liquors. And within five seconds... But that was not cutting it quite fine enough. Just three seconds later, the silver green bud bloomed above Manhattan into a globular orange flower. The skyscrapers grew brighter and brighter still, the brightness of the inside of the sun. The windows winked blossoming white fire flowers. The crowd around Roby bloomed too. Their clothes puffed into petals of flame. Their heads of hair were torches. The orange flower grew, stem and blossom. The blast came. The winking window shattered tier by tier, became black holes. The walls bent, rocked, cracked. A stony dandruff flaked from their cornices. The flaming flowers on the sidewalk were all levelled at once. Roby was shoved ten feet. His metal hoop skirt dimpled, regained its shape. The blast ended. The orange flower, grown vast, vanished overhead on its huge magic beanstalk. It grew dark and very still. The cornice dandruff pattered down. A few small fragments rebounded from the metal hoop skirt. Roby made some small, uncertain movements, as if feeling for broken bones. He was hunting for the traffic light, but it no longer shone either red or green. He slowly scanned a full circle. There was nothing anywhere to interest his reference silhouettes. Yet whenever he tried to move, his underscanners warned him of low obstructions. It was very puzzling. The silence was disturbed by moans and a crackling sound, as faint at first as the scampering of distant rats. A seared man, his charred clothes fuming where the blast had blown out the fire, rose from the curb. Roby scanned him. "'Good day, sir,' Roby said. "'Would you care for a smoke? A truly cool smoke? Now I have here a yet unmarketed brand.' But the customer had run away, screaming, and Roby never ran after customers, though he could follow them at a medium brisk roll. He worked his way along the curb where the man had sprawled, carefully keeping his distance from the low obstructions, some of which writhed now and then, forcing him to jog. Shortly, he reached a fire hydrant. He scanned it. His electronic vision, though it still worked, had been somewhat blurred by the blast. Hello, youngster, Roby said, then after a long pause. Cat got your tongue? Well, I have a little present for you. A nice lovely polylop. Take it, youngster, he said after another pause. It's for you. Don't be afraid. His attention was distracted by other customers, who began to rise up oddly here and there, twisting forms that confused his reference silhouettes and would not stay to be scanned properly. One cried, Water! But no quarter clinked in Roby's claws when he caught the word and suggested, How about a nice refreshing drink of Poppy Pop? The rapt crackling of the flames had become a jungle muttering. The blind windows began to wink fire again. A little girl marched, stepping neatly over arms and legs she did not look at. A white dress and the once taller bodies around her had shielded her from the brilliance and the blast. Her eyes were fixed on Roby. In them was the same imperious confidence, though none of the delight, with which she had watched him earlier. "'Help me, Roby,' she said. "'I want my mother.' "'Hello, youngster,' Roby said. "'What would you like? Comics? Candy?' "'Where is she, Roby?' Take me to her. Balloons? Would you like to watch me blow up a balloon? The little girl began to cry. 
the sound triggered off another of Roby's novelty circuits, a service feature that had brought in a lot of favourable publicity. "'Is something wrong?' he asked. "'Are you in trouble? Are you lost?' "'Yes, Roby. Take me to my mother.' "'Stay right here,' Roby said reassuringly, "'and don't be frightened. I will call a policeman.' He whistled shrilly twice. Time passed. Roby whistled again. The windows flared and roared. The little girl begged, "'Take me away, Roby!' and jumped onto a little step in his hoop skirt. "'Give me a dime,' Roby said. The little girl found one in her pocket and put it in his claws. "'Your weight,' Roby said, "'is fifty-four and one-half pounds.' "'Have you seen my daughter? Have you seen her?' a woman was crying somewhere. "'I left her watching that thing while I stepped inside. Read her!' "'Roby helped me,' the little girl began babbling at her. "'He knew I was lost.' He even called the police, but they didn't come. He weighed me too, didn't you, Roby? But Roby had gone off to peddle Poppy Pop to the members of a rescue squad, which had just come around the corner, more robot-like in their asbestos suits than he in his metal skin. If you're enjoying the stories and would like more in the future, hit the like button to support the channel and let me know. Thanks. What Shall It Profit? by Paul Anderson Narrated by William Skye If you would build a tower, sit down first and count the cost to see if you have enough to finish it. The price may be much too high. The chickens got out of the coop and flew away three hundred years ago, said Barwell. Now they're coming home to roost. He hiccuped. His finger wobbled to the dial and clicked off another whiskey. The machine pondered the matter and flashed an apologetic sign. Please deposit your money. Oh, damn, said Barwell. I'm broke. Radek shrugged and gave the slot a two-credit piece. It slid the whiskey out on a tray with his change. He stuck the coins in his pouch and took another careful sip of beer. Barwell grabbed the whiskey glass like a drowning man. He would drown, thought Radek, if he sloshed much more into his stomach. There was an Asian whine to the music drifting past the curtains into the booth. Radek could hear the talk and laughter well enough to catch their raucous overtones. Somebody swore as dice rattled wrong for him. Somebody else shouted coarse good wishes as his friend took a hostess upstairs. He wondered why Vice was always so cheerless when you went into a place and paid for it. "'I am going to get drunk tonight,' announced Barwell. "'I'm going to get so high in the stony sky you'll need radar to find me. Then I shall raise the red flag of revolution.' "'And tomorrow?' asked Radek quietly. Barwell grimaced. Don't ask me about tomorrow. Tomorrow I will be among the great leisure class. To hell with euphemisms. The unemployed. Nothing I can do that some goddamn machine can't do quicker and better. So a benevolent state will feed me and clothe me and house me and give me a little spending money to have fun on. This is known as citizen's credit. They used to call it a dole. Tomorrow I shall have to be more systematic about the revolution, join the League or something. The trouble with you, Radek needled him, is that you can't adapt. Technology has made the labour of most people, except the first-rank creative genius, unnecessary. This leaves the majority with a void of years to fill somehow, a sense of uprootedness and lost self-respect, which is rather horrible. And in any case, they don't like to think in scientific terms. It doesn't come natural to the average man. Barwell gave him a bleary stare out of a flushed, sagging face. I suppose you're one of the geniuses, he said. You got work. I'm adaptable, said Radek. He was a slim, youngish man with dark hair and sharp features. I'm not greatly gifted, but I found a niche for myself. Newsman. I do legwork for a major commentator. Between times I'm writing a book my own analysis of contemporary historical trends. It won't be anything startling, but it may help a few people think more clearly and adjust themselves. 
And so you like this rotten solar union? Barwell's tone became aggressive. Not everything about it, no. So there is a wave of anti-scientific reaction all over Earth. Science is being made the scapegoat for all our troubles. But like it or not, you fellows will have to accept the fact that there are too many people and too few resources for us to survive without technology. Some technology, sure, admitted Barwell. He took a ferocious swig from his glass. Not this hell-born stuff we've been monkeying around with. I tell you, the chickens have finally come home to roost. Radek was intrigued by the archaic expression. Barwell was no moron. He'd been a correlative clerk at the Institute for several years, not a position for fools. He had read, actually read books, and thought about them. And today, he had been fired. Radek chanced to cross him drinking out a vast resentment, and attached himself like a reverse lamprey, buying most of the liquor. There might be a story in it, somewhere. There might be a lead to what the Institute was doing. Radek was not anti-scientific, but neither did he make gods out of people with technical degrees. The Institute must be up to something unpleasant, otherwise why all the mystery? If the facts weren't uncovered in time, if whatever they were brewing came to a head, it could touch off the final convulsion of Lynch law. Barwell leaned forward, his finger wagged. Three hundred years now. I think it's three hundred years since X-rays came in. Damn scientists, fooling around with X-rays, atomic energy, radioactives. Sure, safe levels, established tolerances, but what about the long-range effects? What about cumulative genetic effects? Those chickens are coming home at last. No use blaming our ancestors, said Radek. Be rather pointless to go dance on their graves, wouldn't it? Barwell moved closer to Radek. His breath was powerful with whiskey. But are they in those graves? he whispered. Huh? Look. Been known for a long time, ever since first atomic energy work. Heavy but non-lethal doses of radiation shorten lifespan. You grow old faster if you get a strong dose. Why do you think with all our medicines we're not two, three hundred years old? Background count's gone up. That's why. Radioactives in the air, in the sea, buried under the ground. Gamma rays, not entirely absorbed by shielding. Sure, sure, they tell us the level is still harmless. But it's more than the level in nature by a good big factor. Two or three. Radek sipped his beer. He'd been drinking slowly, and the beer had gotten warmer than he liked but he needed a clear head. That's common knowledge, he stated. The lifespan hasn't been shortened any either. Because of more medicines, more ways to help cells patch up radiation damage. All but worst radiation sickness been curable for a long time. Barwell waved his hand expansively. They knew, even back then, he mumbled. If radiation shortens life, radiation sickness cures ought to prolong it. Huh? Reasonable. Only the goddamn scientists. Population problem. Social stasis if everybody lived for centuries. Kept it secret. Easy to do. Change your name and face every ten, twenty years. Keep to yourself. Don't make friends among the short-lived. You might see them grow old and die. Might start feeling sorry for them and that would never do, would it? Coldness tingled along Radek's spine. He lifted his mug and pretended to drink. Over the rim his eyes stayed on Barwell. That's why they fired me. I know. I know. I got ears. I overheard things. I read. Notes not intended for me. They fired me. It's a wonder they didn't murder me. Barwell shuddered and peered at the curtains as if trying to look through them. Or oh, do you think? Maybe. No, said Radek. I don't. Let's stick to the facts. I take it you found mention of work on, shall we say, increasing the lifespan. Perhaps a mention of successes with rats and guinea pigs, right? So what's wrong with that? They wouldn't want to announce anything till they were sure, or the hysteria. Barwell smiled with an irritating air of omniscience. More on that, friend. More on that. Lots more. Well, what? Barwell peered about him with exaggerated caution. One thing I found in files, 
plans of whole buildings and grounds great great big room lots of rooms way way underground secret only the kitchen was making food and sending it down there human food food for people i never saw people who never came up barwell buried his face in his hands don't feel so good whirling radek eased his head to the table out like a spent credit the newsman left the booth and addressed a bouncer. Chap in there has had it. Uh-huh. Want me to help you get him to your boat? No, I hardly know him. A bill exchanged hands. Put him in your dos room to sleep it off, and give him breakfast with my compliments. I'm going out for some fresh air. The wreck house stood on a Minnesota bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. Beyond its racket and multicolored glare, there was darkness and wooded silence. Here and there the lights of a few isolated houses gleamed. The river slid by, talking, ruffled with moonlight. Luna was nearly full. Squinting into her cold ashen face, Radek could just see the tiny spark of a city. Stars were strewn carelessly over heaven. He recognized the ember that was Mars. Perhaps he ought to emigrate. Mars, Venus, even Luna. There was more hope on them than Earth had. No mechanical packaged cheer. People had work to do, and in their spare time made their own pleasures. No civilization cracking at the seams because it could not assimilate the technology it must have. Out in space, men knew very well that science had carried them to their homes, and made those homes fit to dwell on. Radek strolled across the parking lot and found his airboat. He paused by its iridescent teardrop to start a cigarette. Suppose the Institute of Human Biology was more than it claimed to be, more than a set of homes and laboratories where congenial minds could live and do research. It published discoveries of value, but how much did it not publish? Its personnel kept pretty aloof from the rest of the world, not unnatural in this day of growing estrangement between science and public, but did they have a deeper reason than that? Suppose they did keep immortals in those underground rooms. A scientist was not ordinarily a good political technician, but he might think he could be. He might react emotionally against a public beginning to throw stones at his house and consider taking the reins, for the people's own good, of course. A lot of misery had been caused to the human race for its own alleged good. Or if the scientist knew how to live forever, he might not think Joe Smith or Carlos Ibanez or Wang Yuan or Johannes um van Dumba good enough to share immortality with him. Radek took a long breath. The night air felt fresh and alive in his lungs after the tavern staleness. He was not currently married, but there was a girl with whom he was thinking seriously of making a permanent contract. He had friends, not lucent razor-minds, but decent, unassuming, kindly people, brave with man's old quiet bravery in the face of death and ruin, and the petty tragedies of every day. He liked beer and steaks, fishing and tennis, good music and a good book, and the exhilarating strain of his work. He liked to live. Maybe a system for becoming immortal, or at least living many centuries, was not desirable for the race, but only the whole race had authority to make that decision. Radek smiled at himself twistedly, and threw the cigarette away, and got into the boat. Its engine murmured, sucking cast power. The riding light snapped on automatically, and he lifted into the sky. It was not much of a lead he had, but it was as good as he was ever likely to get. He set the autopilot for southwest Colorado and opened the jets wide. The night whistled darkly around his cabin. Against one stars, he made out the lamps of other boats flitting across the world and somehow intensifying their loneliness work to do. He called the main office in Dallas unit and taped a statement of what he knew and what he planned. Then he dialed the nearest library and asked the robot for information on the Institute of Human Biology. There wasn't a great deal of value to him. It had been in existence for about 250 years, more or less concurrently with the Psychotechnic Institute, and for quite a while affiliated with that organization. During the humanist troubles, when the psychotechs were booted out of government on Earth and their files ransacked, it had disassociated itself from them 
and carried on unobtrusively. How much of their secret records had it taken along? Since the restoration, it had grown, drawing in many prominent researchers and making discoveries of high value to medicine and bioengineering. The current director was Dr. Marcus Lang, formerly of New Harvard, the University of Luna, and no matter. He'd been running the show for eight years after his predecessor's death. Or had Tokugama really died? He couldn't be identical with Lang. He had been a short Japanese, and Lang was a tall African-American, too big a jump for any surgeon. Not to mention their simultaneous careers. But how far back could you trace Lang before he became fakeable records of birth and schooling? What young fellow named Yamatsu or Hideki was now polishing glass in the labs and slated to become the next director? How fantastic could you get on how little evidence? Radek let the text fade from the screen and sat puffing another cigarette. It was a while before he demanded references on the biology of the aging process. That was tough sledding. He couldn't follow the mathematics or the chemistry very far. No good popularizations were available. But a newsman got an ability to winnow what he learned. Radek didn't have to take notes. He'd been through a mind training course. After an hour or so, he sat back and reviewed what he had gotten. The living organism was a small island of low entropy in a universe tending constantly toward gigantic disorder. It maintained itself through an intricate set of hemostatic mechanisms. The serious disruption of any of these brought the life processes to a halt. Shock, disease, the bullet in the lungs or the axe in the brain, death. But hundreds of thousands of autopsies had never given an honest verdict of death from old age. It was always something else. Cancer, heart failure, sickness, stroke. Age was at most a contributing cause, decreasing resistance to injury and power to recover from it. One by one, the individual causes had been licked. Bacteria and protozoa and viruses were slaughtered in the body. Cancers were selectively poisoned. Cholesterol was dissolved out of the arteries. Surgery patched up damaged organs, and the new regeneration techniques replaced what had been lost, even nervous tissue. Offhand, there was no more reason to die, unless he met murder or an accident. But people still grew old. The process wasn't as hideous as it had been. You needn't shuffle in arthritic feebleness. Your mind was clear, your skin wrinkled slowly. Centenarians were not uncommon these days. But very few reached 150. Nobody reached 200. Imperceptibly, the fires burned low. Vitality was diminished. Strength faded. Hair whitened. Eyes dimmed. The body responded less and less well to regenerative treatment. Finally, it did not respond at all. You got so weak that some small thing you and your doctor could have laughed at in your youth took you away. You still grew old. And because you grew old, you still died. The unicellular organism did not age. But age was a meaningless word in that particular case. A man could be immortal via his germ cells. The microorganism could too, but it gave the only cell it had. Personal immortality was denied to both man and microbe. Could sheer mechanical wear and tear be the reason for the decline known as old age? Probably not. The natural regenerative powers of life were better than that, and observations made in freefall, where strain was minimized, indicated that while null gravity had an alleviating effect, it was no key to living forever. Something in the chemistry and physics of the cells themselves, then. They did tend to accumulate heavy water, that had been known for a long time. Hard to see how that could kill you. The percentage increase in a lifetime was so small. It might be a partial answer. You might grow old more slowly if you drank only water made of pure isotopes, but you wouldn't be immortal. Radek shrugged. He was getting near the end of his trip. Let the Institute people answer his questions. The Four Corners country is so named because four of the old American states met there, back when they were still significant political units. For a while, in the 20th century, it was overrun with uranium hunters, who made small impression on its tilted emptiness. It was still a favourite vacation area, and the resorts were lost in that great huddle of mountains and desert. You could have a lot of privacy here. 
Gliding down over the moon ghostly Pueblo ruins of Mesa Verde, Radek peered through the windscreen. There, ahead. Lights glowed around the walls spread across half a mesa. Inside them was a parkscape of trees, lawns, gardens, arbors, cottage units. The institute housed its people well. There were four large buildings at the centre, and Radek noted gratefully that several windows were still shining in them. Not that he had any compunctions about getting the great Dr. Lang out of bed, but... He ignored the public landing field outside the walls, and set his boat down in the paved courtyard. As he climbed out, half a dozen guards came running. They were husky men in blue uniforms armed with stunners, and the dim light showed faces hinting they wouldn't be sorry to feed him a beam. Radek dropped to the ground, folded his arms, and waited. The breath from his nose was frosty under the moon. "'What the hell do you want?' The nearest guard pulled up in front of him and laid a hand on his shotgun. "'Who the devil are you? Don't you know this is private property? What's the big idea, anyway?' "'Take it easy,' advised Radek. "'I have to see Dr. Lang at once. Emergency. You didn't call for an appointment, did you?' "'No, I didn't.' All right, then. I didn't think you'd care to have me give my reasons over a radio. This is confidential and urgent. The men hesitated, uncertain before such an outrageous violation of all civilized canons. I don't know, friend. He's busy. If you want to see Dr. McCormick... Dr. Lang. Ask him if I may. Tell him I have news about his longevity process. His what? Radek spelled it out and watched the man go. Another one made some ungracious remark and frisked him with needless ostentation. A third was more urbane. Sorry to do this, but you understand we've got important work going on. Can't have just anybody busting in. Sure, that's all right. Radek shivered in the thin, chill air and pulled his cloak tighter about him. Viruses and stuff around. If any of that got loose, you understand. Well, it wasn't a bad cover-up. None of these fellows looked very bright. IQ treatments could do only so much. Thereafter, you got down to the limitations of basic and unalterable brain microstructure. And even among the more intellectual workers. How many Barwells were there handling semi-routine tasks, but not permitted to know what really went on under their feet? Radek had a brief irrational wish that he'd worn boots instead of sandals. The first guard returned. He'll see you, he grunted. And you better make it good, because he's one mad doctor. Radek nodded and followed two of the men. The nearest of the large square buildings seemed given over to offices. He was led inside, down a short length of glow-lit corridor, and halted while the scanner on a door marked Lang Director observed him. He's clean, boss, said one of the escort. All right, said the enunciator. Let him in. But you two stay just outside. It was a spacious office, but austerely furnished. A telly window reflected green larches and a sun-spattered waterfall somewhere on the other side of the planet. Lang sat alone behind the desk, his hands engaged with some papers that looked like technical reports. He was a big, heavy-shouldered man, his hair grey, his brown face middle-aged and tired. He did not rise. Well, he snapped. My name is Arnold Radek. I'm a news service operator. Here's my card if you wish to see it. Pharaoh had it easy, said Lang in a chill voice. Moses only called the seven plagues down on him. I have to deal with your sort. Radek placed his fingertips on the desk and leaned forward. He found it unexpectedly hard not to be stared down by the other. I know very well I've laid myself open to a lawsuit by coming in as I did, he stated. Possibly, when I'm through, I'll be open to murder. Are you feeling well? There was more contempt than concern in the deep tone. Let me say first off, I believe I have information about a certain project of yours. One you badly want to keep a secret. I've taped a record at my office of what I know and where I'm going. If I don't get back before ten hundred hours central time and wipe that tape, it'll be heard by the secretary. Lang took an exasperated breath. His fingernails whitened on the sheets he still held. Do you honestly think we would be so, I won't say unscrupulous, so stupid as to use violence? No, said Radek, of course not. 
All I want is a few straight answers. I know you're quite able to lead me up the garden path, feed me some line of pap, and hustle me out again, but I won't stand for that. I mentioned my tape only to convince you that I'm in earnest. You're not drunk, murmured Lang, but there are a lot of people running loose who ought to be in a mental hospital. I know, Raddick sat down without waiting for an invitation. Anti-scientific fanatics. I'm not one of them. You know Darrell Burkhart's news commentaries? I supply a lot of his data and interpretations. He's one of the leading friends of genuine science, one of the few you have left. Raddick gestured at the card on the desk. Read it, right there. Lang picked the card up and glanced at the lettering and tossed it back. Very well. That's still no excuse for breaking in like this. You— It can't wait, interrupted Raddick. There are a lot of lives at stake. Every minute we sit here, there are perhaps a million people dying, perhaps more. I haven't the figures. And everyone else is dying all the time, millimetre by millimetre. We're all born dying. Every minute you hold back the cure for old age, you murder a million human beings. This is the most fantastic— Let me finish. I get around, and I'm trained to look a little bit more closely at the facts everybody knows, the ordinary commonplace facts we take for granted and never think to inquire about because they are so ordinary. I've wondered about the Institute for a long time. Tonight, I talked at great length with a fellow named Barwell. Remember him? A clerk here. You fired him this morning for being too nosy. He had a lot to say. Hmm. Lang sat quiet for a while. He didn't rattle easily. He couldn't be snowed under by fast, aggressive talk. While Radek spat out what clues he had, Lang calmly reached into a drawer and got out an old-fashioned briar pipe, stuffed it, and lit it. So, what do you want? he asked when Radek paused for breath. The truth, damn it! There are privacy laws. It was established long ago that a citizen is entitled to privacy if he does nothing against the common wheel. And you are! You're like a man who stands on a river bank and has a life belt and won't throw it to a man drowning in the river. Lang sighed. I won't deny we're working on longevity, he answered. Obviously we are. The problem interests biologists throughout the solar system. But we aren't publicizing our findings as yet for a very good reason. You know how people jump to conclusions. Can you imagine the hysteria that would arise in this already unstable culture if there seemed to be even a prospect of immortality? You yourself are a prime case. On the most tenuous basis of rumor and hypothesis, you've decided that we have found a vaccine against old age and are hoarding it. You come bursting in here in the middle of the night demanding to be made immortal immediately, if not sooner. And you're comparatively civilized. There are enough lunatics who'd come here with guns and start shooting up the place. Radek smiled bleakly. Of course, I know that, and you ought to know the outfit I work for is reputable. If you have a good lead on the problem, but haven't solved it yet, you can trust us not to make that fact public. All right, Lang mustered an answering smile, oddly warm and charming. I don't mind telling you, then, that we do have some promising preliminary results. But, and this is the catch, we estimate it will take at least a century to get anywhere. Biochemistry is an inconceivably complex subject. What sort of results are they? It's highly technical. Has to do with enzymes. You may know that enzymes are the major device through which the genes govern the organism all through life. At a certain point, for instance, the genes order the body to go through the changes involved in puberty. At another point, they order that gradual breakdown we know as aging. In other words, said Radek slowly, the body has a built-in suicide mechanism. Well, if you want to put it that way. I don't believe a word of it. It makes a lot more sense to imagine that there's something which causes the breakdown, a virus maybe, and the body fights it off as long as possible, but at last it gets the upper hand. The whole key to evolution is the need to survive. I can't see life evolving its own anti-survival factor. But nature doesn't care about the individual, friend Radek. Only about the species. And the species with a rapid turnover of individuals can evolve faster, become more effective. Then why does man, the fastest evolving metazoan of all, have one of the longest lifespans? He does, you know, among mammals at any rate. 
Seems to me our bodies must be all around better than average, better able to fight off the death virus. Fish live a longer time, sure, and maybe in the water they aren't so exposed to the disease. Mayflies are short-lived. Have they simply adapted their life cycle to the existence of the virus? Lang frowned. You appear to have studied this subject enough to have some mistaken ideas about it. I can't argue with a man who insists on protecting his cherished irrationalities with fancy verbalisms. And you appear to think fast on your feet, Dr. Lang, Raddick laughed. Maybe not fast enough. But I'm not being paranoid about this. You can convince me. How? Show me. Take me into those underground rooms and show me what you actually have. I'm afraid that's impos- All right, Radek stood up. I hate to do this, but a man must either earn a living or go on the public freeloading roll, which I don't want to do. The facts and conjectures I already have will make an interesting story. Lang rose too, his eyes widening. You can't prove anything. Of course I can't. You're sitting on all the proof. But the public reaction! God in heaven, man, those people can't think! No, they can't, can they? He moved toward the door. Good night. Radek's muscles were taut. In spite of everything that had been said, a person hounded to desperation could still do murder. There was a great quietness as he neared the door. Then Lang spoke. The voice was defeated, and when Radek looked back, it was an old man who stood behind the desk. You win. Come along with me. They went down an empty hall after dismissing the guards, and took an elevator below ground. Neither of them said anything. Somehow the sag of Lang's shoulders was annoying in Radek's conscience. When they emerged, it was to transfer past a sentry, where Lang gave a password and okayed his companion, to another elevator which purred them still deeper. I, the newsman cleared his throat awkwardly, I repeat what I implied earlier. I'm here mostly as a citizen interested in the public welfare, which includes my own, of course, and my family's if I ever have one. If you can show me valid reasons for not breaking this story, I won't. I'll even let you hypno-condition me against doing it, voluntarily or otherwise. Thanks, said the director. His mouth curved upward, but it was a shaken smile. That's decent of you, and we'll accept. I think you'll agree with our policy. What worries me is the rest of the world. If you could find out as much as you did— Radek's heart jumped between his ribs. Then you do have immortality. Yes, but I'm not immortal. None of our personnel are, except— Here we are. There was a hidden susurrus of machinery as they stepped out into a small, bare entry room. Another guard sat there, beside a desk. Past him was a small door of immense solidity the door of a vault. "'You'll have to leave everything metallic here,' said Lang. "'A steel object could jump so fiercely as to injure you. Your watch would be ruined. Even coins could get uncomfortably hot. Eddy currents, you know. We're about to go through the strongest magnetic field ever generated.' Silently, dry-mouthed, Radek piled his things on the desk. Lang operated a combination lock on the door. There are nervous effects, too, he said. The field is actually strong enough to influence the electric discharges of your synapses. Be prepared for a few nasty seconds. Follow me and walk fast. The door opened on a low, narrow corridor several meters long. Radek felt his heart bump crazily, his vision blurred. There was panic screaming in his brain and a sweating tingle in his skin. Stumbling through nightmare, he made it to the end. The horror faded. They were in another room with storage facilities and what resembled a spaceship's airlock in the opposite wall. Lang grinned shakily. No fun, is it? What's it for? gasped Radek. To keep charged particles out of here. And the whole set of chambers is five hundred meters underground, sheathed in ten meters of lead brick and surrounded by tanks of heavy water. This is the only place in the solar system, I imagine, where cosmic rays never come. You mean? Lang knocked out his pipe and left it in a gaboon. He opened the lockers to reveal a set of air suits complete with helmets and oxygen tanks. We put these on before going any further, he said. 
Infection on the other side? We're the infected ones. Come on, I'll help you. As they scrambled into the equipment, Lang added conversationally, This place has to have all its own stuff, of course, its own electric generators and so on. The ultimate power source is isotopically pure carbon burned in oxygen. We use a nuclear reactor to create the magnetic field itself, but no atomic energy is allowed inside it. He led the way into the airlock, closed it, and started the pumps. We have to flush out all the normal air and substitute that from the inner chambers. How about food? Barwell said food was prepared in the kitchens and brought here. Synthesized out of elements recovered from waste products. We do cook it topside, taking precautions. A few radioactive atoms get in, but not enough to matter as long as we're careful. We're so cramped for space down here we have to make some compromises. I think... Radek fell silent. As the lock was evacuated, his unjointed airsuit spread-eagled and held him prisoner, but he hardly noticed. There was too much else to think about, too much to grasp at once. Not till the cycle was over and they had gone through the lock did he speak again. Then it came harsh and jerky. I begin to understand. How long has this gone on? It started about two hundred years ago, an early institute project. Lang's voice was somehow tinny over the helmet phone. At that time it wasn't possible to make really pure isotopes in quantity, so there were only limited results. But it was enough to justify further research. This particular set of chambers and chemical elements is 150 years old. A spectacular success, a brilliant confirmation from the very beginning, and the Institute has never dared reveal it. Maybe they should have back then. Maybe people could have taken the news, but not now. These days the knowledge would whip men into a murderous rage of frustration. They wouldn't believe the truth, they wouldn't dare believe, and God alone knows what they'd do. Looking around, Radek saw a large plastic-lined room filled with cages. As the lights went on, white rats and guinea pigs stirred sleepily. One of the rats came up to nibble at the wires and regard the humans from beady pink eyes. Lang bent over and studied the label. This fellow is, um, sixty-six years old. Still fat and sassy, in perfect condition, as you can see. Our oldest mammalian inmate is a guinea pig. A hundred and forty-five years. This one here. Lang stared at the immortal beast for a while. It didn't look unusual, only healthy. How about monkeys? he asked. We tried them. Finally gave it up. A monkey is an active animal. It was too cruel to keep them penned up forever. They even went insane, some of them. Footfalls were hollow as Lang led the way toward the inner door. Do you get the idea? Yes. I think I do. If heavy radiation speeds up aging, then natural radioactivity is responsible for normal aging. Quite. A matter of cells being slowly deranged through decades in the case of man, the genes which govern them being mutilated, chromosomes ripped up, nucleoplasm and cytoplasm irreversibly damaged. And of course, a mutated cell often puts out the wrong combination of enzymes, and if it regenerates at all, it replaces itself by one of the same kind. The effect is cumulative, more and more defective cells every hour. A steady bombardment all your life. Here on Earth, seven cosmic rays per second rippling through you, and you yourself are radioactive. You include radiocarbon and radiopotassium and radiophosphorus. Earth and the planets, the atmosphere, everything radiates. Is it any wonder that our last organic mechanism starts breaking down? The marvel is that we live as long as we do. The dry voice was somehow steadying. Radek asked. And this place is insulated? Yes, the original plant and animal life in here was grown exogenetically from single-cell zygotes, supplied with air and nourishment built from pure stable isotopes. The Institute had to start with low forms, naturally. At that time it wasn't possible to synthesize proteins to order. But soon our workers had enough of an ecology to introduce higher species, eventually mammals. Even the first generation was only negligibly radioactive. Succeeding generations have been kept almost absolutely clean. The lamps supply ultraviolet, the air is recycled. Well, in principle it's no different from an ecological unit spaceship. Radek shook his head. He could scarcely get the words out. People? Humans? 
for the past 120 years. Wasn't hard to get germplasm and grow it. The first generation reproduced normally. The second could if lack of space didn't force us to load their food with chemical contraceptive. Behind his faceplate, Lang grimaced. I'd never have allowed it if I'd been director at the time, but now I'm stuck with the situation. The legality is very doubtful. How badly do you violate a man's civil rights when you keep him a prisoner but give him immortality? He opened the door, an archaic manual type. We can't do better for them than this, he said. The volume of space we can enclose in a magnetic field of the necessary strength is already at an absolute maximum. Light sprang automatically from the ceiling. Radek looked in at a dormitory. It was well kept, the furniture ornamental. Beyond it he could see other rooms, recreation he supposed vaguely. The score of hulks in the beds hardly moved. Only one woke up. He blinked, yawned, and shuffled toward the visitors, quite nude, his long hair tangled across the low forehead, a loose grin on the mouth. "'Hello, Bill,' said Lang. "'Ah, uh, got something? Got something for Bill?' A hand reached out, begging. Radek thought of a trained ape he had once seen. "'This is Bill,' Lang spoke softly, as if afraid his voice would snap. "'Our oldest inhabitant. One hundred and nineteen years old, and he has the physique of a man of twenty. They mature, you know, reach their peak, and never fall below it again. Got something, Doc, huh? I'm sorry, Bill, said Lang. I'll bring you some candy next time. The moron gave an animal sigh and shambled back. On the way, he passed a sleeping woman and edged toward her with a grunt. Lang closed the door. There was another stillness. Well, said Lang, now you've seen it. You mean... You don't mean immortality makes you like that? Oh, no, not at all. But my predecessors chose low-grade stock on purpose. Remember those monkeys? How long do you think a normal human could remain sane, cooped up in a little cave like this and never daring to leave it? That's the only way to be immortal, you know. And how much of the race could be given such elaborate care, even if they could stand it? Only a small percentage. Nor would they live forever. They're already contaminated. They were born radioactive. And whatever happens, who's going to remain outside and keep the apparatus in order? Radek nodded. His neck felt stiff, and within the airsuit he stank with sweat. I've got the idea. And yet, if the facts were known, if my questions had to be answered, how long do you think a society like ours would survive? Radek tried to speak, but his tongue was too dry. Lang smiled grimly. Apparently I've convinced you. Good. Fine. Suddenly his gloved hand shot out and gripped Radek's shoulder. Even through the heavy fabric the newsman could feel the bruising fury of that clasp. But you're only one man, whispered Lang. An unusually reasonable man for these days. There'll be others. What are we going to do? Road Stop by David Mason Narrated by William Skye It was like any other car on the road. It was automatic, self-contained, and eternal. The highway stretched away in ruler-straight perspective toward both horizons, black and shining in the sun like a river of ink. Beside it, the bright pastel buildings of Rest Stop 25 stood among the green trees. Occasionally a car shot past, a flash of metal and a hiss of split wind, but the road was one which was used more often at night and was nearly empty in the afternoon. Sam was the only attendant on duty. Stop 25 needed only two human attendants even at its busiest hours. He sat staring out at the highway, his elbows on the lunch counter, his round face blank, but his mouth set tightly. The phone at his elbow emitted a small grunting noise. You still there? the phone voice said inquiringly. Yeah, Sam said, still staring at the highway. Well, the voice paused. Look, it might not come your way. 
and usually turns west at the New Britain intersection. Not always, Sam said. It went by here once before. It almost never stops anyway, the voice said firmly. It won't stop. Sometimes it does, Sam said. It doesn't have to. Sam shrugged and said nothing. Okay then, the voice said. I called you about it anyway. Thanks. Sam turned away, still watching the road. Far off a speck of metal gleamed, growing larger. The distant high sound of brakes began as a car decelerated, coming toward the stop. It was just an ordinary car, Sam told himself. That other car was still hundreds of miles away. But his hands were damp as he watched it grow larger. It was an ordinary Talman sedan with two people in it. It swung into the stop's parking area and its doors slid open smoothly. A small red light flashed on its arched front. The repair signal. In response, the doors of the repair shop opened. The Talman waited as a man and a woman emerged from its padded interior and moved slowly into the repair shop. The doors closed behind it. The couple came toward the restaurant where Sam stood waiting. Hi, the man said to Sam. Afternoon, Sam moved to the counter. Something to eat while you're waiting, folks? The tall, dark girl glanced out at the closed doors of the repair shop. How long's that car going to take? she asked in a tired voice. I wanted to get home tonight. Not long, Sam said. It didn't look like anything complicated. How can you tell? the man asked, sitting down. It could take all night. Like something to eat while you're waiting? Sam asked. The woman stared at the lunch racks critically. I never like these places to eat in, the woman said, curling her lip. You never know how long the food's been stored in the robot. Oh, hell, Grace, the man said wearily. To Sam, he gave an apologetic shrug. Just coffee. Well, you don't know, the woman insisted. I mean, she watched Sam drawing the coffee into a cup. I used to cook a lot by hand till Jack had the auto kitchen put in. He never had any stomach trouble till then. It's getting so everything's... Oh, I don't know. It's all out of reach. You don't know what's happening anymore. Like the car. I wish I knew what she's talking about half the time, Jack said, blowing on his coffee. Sam leaned on the counter, looking past the couple toward the empty road. I know what the lady means, Sam said, almost to himself. You get to thinking. Well, I can remember when people used to drive their own cars. Themselves. Steering and everything, except on the biggest highways. And everything got done with people. People made things and cooked food and grew plants. Everybody was busy all the time. It was better then. The man called Jack shrugged. Sure, sure. Everybody always talks about the good old days. But I don't see many of them going to live in the woods. Like Grace, she says she doesn't like the auto kitchen, but she uses it. It saves time, Grace said. I guess I will have coffee too, mister. It saves time, she says, Jack said. For what? She's got too much time now. I wonder what it must have been like in the old days here. Grace said vaguely, staring around the lunchroom. Everybody running in and out, all the drivers, trucks with men in them, the way you read about it in the historical novels. Men that drove their own cars in all kinds of weather. Gee. Just like on TV, Sam said, grinning. I hope we get the car out of there pretty soon, Jack said anxiously. He glanced out toward the silent garage. I always wonder what would happen if the machinery stuck or something. How would you ever get your car out? It doesn't get stuck, Sam said. A peculiar look crossed his face as he added, Not any more. Did it ever? Sam shrugged. 
Oh, well, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, all this automatic stuff wasn't quite so good as it is now. Cars, repair shops, things went wrong sometimes. Like, like the Traveller. The Traveller? The woman looked up. Oh, that's just a ghost story. Like the Flying Dutchman. Isn't it? The lunchroom was completely silent. Sam was no longer paying any attention to the couple sitting at the counter. He was close to the big window, standing stiffly, feet apart, like an admiral on a ship's bridge, his eyes studying the empty horizon. There, where the lines of the road met with the precision of a drawing board exercise in perspective, he thought he saw a fleck of light. It isn't when it goes past, Sam said in a quiet, tight voice. He talked at the window, his back to the other two, his words meant mostly for himself. It's not its going by. That doesn't bother me, he repeated. It came by my old place five or six times, I remember. That's why I finally asked to be transferred out here, where it hardly ever goes by. But I could have gotten used to it. I mean, you don't have to look at it or anything. It's just another car. Old, sure, but there's no difference. A car goes by, that's all. Only... You mean it's real? the woman asked in a low voice. Her husband's eyes were looking out toward the empty road, following Sam's look. The Traveller, he said, without looking at his wife. Sure, it's real. Why do you think they don't make that model of car any more? It's real. I knew somebody who saw it once. There might even be two or three Travellers, Sam said, watching the distant glitter of light. There was certainly a car coming. Just a car, although it was still too far away to tell for sure. A haunted car! the woman said, her eyes wider. Gee! It isn't a haunted car, her husband said. It's just one of the earliest makes of automatic highway cars. Everything automatic, steering, destination set, just like any car is nowadays. Only it wasn't quite perfect, somehow. They got into their car, Sam said, his eyes picking out distant, microscopic details. The high, flaring fins, the double headlamps lit up although it was broad daylight on the road. He knew what the rest would be. It was moving so slowly. But it always moved slowly, barely thirty miles an hour. As if somebody wanted you to look and see. They just got in the way anybody would do, Sam said. They set a destination, and the windows closed up, and the air conditioner went on, and the car went out on the road. Only it never got there, the other man said, wherever it was going to go. But, the woman looked puzzled, wouldn't anybody stop it? I mean, wouldn't it run out of fuel, or, well, how did the people in it get out? It does just what any car does, her husband told her. It gets fuel when it needs it. You can't just stop a robot control device, not till it's good and ready. But the people in it, she said, they'd starve or something. The car called the Traveller, rolling at the stately thirty miles an hour it always held, was coming down the road now, and the two men stood, watching. The woman, a little behind them, watched too, her face growing whiter. No one said anything as the old-fashioned car rolled by, straight and steady down the highway, holding the centre of the lane as sharply as it always did. There was a film of dust inside the windows, though the traveller was clean and shining outside. But the film did hide the white bone faces, the despairing hands that had long ago stopped trying to break through those closed windows. They never did get out, the man named Jack said, as the traveller rolled on, growing smaller along the endless road. I don't mind it when it goes past, Sam said his voice thinner-edged. I really don't. It's just a car. Things like that used to happen. I mean, it's a car. Even when it stops to get gas, I don't have to pay any attention. He looked at the couple, his mouth loose. 
as long as it just goes on. That's all right. But I keep thinking some day it'll stop, and the door will open. And maybe, maybe they'll want lunch. He giggled uncontrollably and then choked it back. Outside, the big hangar doors of the repair shop opened. The car that had been inside appeared. It moved out and stopped, its doors open invitingly. Your car's ready now, Sam told the couple. So long, folks. Have a nice trip. Remember to hit the like button if you want more stories like these. It also helps me grow the channel. Thanks. Dark Dawn by Henry Kuttner Writing under the pseudonym Keith Hammond Narrated by William Skye Blinded by an atomic blast, Dan Gresham joins forces with the Radiant Swimmers to preserve an undersea civilization. The Albacore was 800 miles out of Suva, feeling her way through the Pacific toward a destination unmarked except on the charts. She was a Navy cruiser jury-rigged into a floating laboratory, Navy manned but carrying a dozen specialised technicians as passengers. For days she had waited outside the danger area till circling planes radioed word that the test atomic blast had apparently subsided. Then the Albacore went into a flurry of preparations. It was a miracle that the watch had sighted Gresham in his rubber boat, and a triple miracle that he was alive. His eyes bandaged, he sat out on deck, while Black, the neurologist, leaned on the rail beside him and stared aft. Presently Black took out a pack of cigarettes, automatically held it out to Gresham, and then remembered that the man was blind. Cigarette, he said. Yes, thanks. Is that you, Dr. Black? Gresham's voice was very low. Uh-huh. Here. I was watching that shark. He's followed us from Suva. Big one? One of the biggest I ever saw, Black said. That's the baby who tried to take a chunk out of you when we picked you up. He kept biting at our oars. A pity he didn't get me, Gresham said. He tossed the cigarette away. No use. If I can't see the smoke, I can't enjoy it. The neurologist studied his patient. We don't know that you're permanently blinded, after all. This is so new. I was looking straight at it, Gresham said bitterly. It must have been miles and miles away, but I could feel it burning my eyes out in one flash. Don't tell me. All right, I won't. But this is a completely new type of atomic blast. It isn't uranium. It's a controlled chain reaction based on an artificial element. There must be new types of radiation involved. Fine. The next time there's a war we can blind everybody. Gresham laughed grimly. I'll be sorry for myself for a few months, probably. Then I'll get a seeing eye dog and become a useful member of society again. Huh. He paused. When he spoke again, his voice was different, doubtful, as if he didn't quite realise he spoke aloud. Or maybe not, he said. Maybe I'll never be useful any more. Maybe I'm not just imagining. Imagining? Black said, interested. What? Gresham jerked his bandaged face away. Nothing he declared sharply. Forget it. Black shrugged. Tell me about yourself, Gresham, he suggested. We haven't had much time yet to get acquainted. How did you happen to be out here just now? Gresham shook his head irritably. Just at the wrong spot and the wrong time? Maybe it was meant that way from the start. Predestination. How do I know? Oh, I had enough after the war. I bummed around the islands. I like the sea, his voice softened. Like isn't strong enough. I love the sea. I can't stay away from it. There's a fascination, 
I signed on here and there as a deckhand, a stevedore. I didn't care what. I just wanted to soak myself in the big things. Sun and sea and sky. Well, I can still feel the sun and the wind, and I can hear the water. But I can't see it. There was no real conviction in the way he finished that last sentence. He turned his bandaged eyes a little to Black's left, and his face grew strained as if he were looking at something far out at sea. You know about the radar sonics, don't you? The neurologist said. Oh, sure. I'll learn to bounce a radar beam around me and keep from walking into walls. But... Gresham's voice died. He seemed to be staring as if through the bandages and his own blindness at something far away. In spite of himself, Black turned to follow that blinded stare. And at a great distance off he saw, or thought he saw, something in the glare of the sun track splash water and dive. Talk to Black, Gresham was saying in that strained, doubtful voice. Dr. Black, how are you on psychiatry? Why, fair. Black kept the surprise out of his tone with an effort. Why? Have you noticed any symptoms of aberration in me? Nothing unusual. Nervous shock, of course. That atomic blast catching you certainly would have caused a strain. Gresham said. After the blast went off, I floated for I don't know how long before you picked me up. I started to imagine things. Delirium, you could say. But I don't know. I... I'll forget it, will you? Maybe later I'll feel like talking. Just forget I said anything, Dr. Black. After all, there was nothing to talk about, to put into coherent words. For what had happened was inexplicable. It was part of the terra incognita that the key of nuclear energy had unlocked. Even Daniel Gresham, drowsing the years away in his tropical lotus lands, could not help hearing about the new atomic experiments. He had stopped keeping track of time back in 1946, because around the archipelagos time was a variable, and hours could last for seconds or months, depending on whether you were at a Kava Kava festival with the golden-skinned Melanesians, or simply stretched flat on the warm deck while white canvas billowed overhead and waves splashed quietly along the keel. But the radio wouldn't stop talking. It talked about the uranium piles constructed for experiments, and the new lithium hydride methods, and the technicians who were endlessly charting, testing, studying, and finding fresh mysteries always beyond. And this latest test, a completely new type of atomic blast, one that had never existed before on Earth, except perhaps so long ago that the planet was a white-hot molten mass. Briefly, the Holocaust had blazed out and vanished. But it had left traces in the instruments planted in the path of the Fury, and it had left its trace too in an intricate, sensitive instrument cage inside Daniel Gresham's skull. Thoughts can be measured. They are electric energy. The machine that transmits them can be functionally altered. And adrift on his raft, Gresham had found a very strange substitute for his lost vision. The Albacore's boat came back with recording instruments from a floating buoy, and Black paced slowly up and down the deck, studying a coil of paper and trying to ignore the piping of seabirds that flapped overhead and the look of strained attention on Gresham's face. It didn't belong there on a blind man's face. Gresham sat as he had yesterday, bandaged eyes turned toward the sea beyond the boat as if he could see something out there invisible to ordinary eyes. Doctor, what does that look like out there? he asked suddenly. Startled, Black followed the direction of his pointing finger. Why, a porpoise, I think. It... no, now it's gone. He stared at his patient in amazement. Gresham, are you still blind? Gresham laughed softly. There's a bandage over my eyes, isn't there? Of course I'm blind. Then how did you know about the porpoise? It isn't a porpoise. Black took a long breath. What the devil's the matter with you, Gresham? he said. I wish I knew. I... Gresham's voice hesitated. Then he said with a sudden rush, You could call it hallucination. I can see things, but not with my own eyes. 
Yes? Black's tone was hushed. He was terribly afraid of interrupting this mood of explanation. Go on. Right now, for example, Gresham said in his soft voice. I'm seeing this ship from about half a mile away. I can see the smoke and the little figures on deck. I can see myself and you. From a distance. Once in a while a wave blocks my sight. You're holding something white. Black stared off into the blue distance where what had seemed a porpoise had broken water once and vanished. He could see nothing but ocean now. I told you I started imagining things on the raft, Gresham went on. I kept seeing things from different angles. I knew I was blind, but there were flashes, green vistas, blue sky and white clouds. Memory. Imagination. It isn't a porpoise, Gresham said. Black made an effort and pulled his mind into better coordination. Now listen, he said. All right. You are in the direct path of some new radiations. These figures, he rustled the paper in his hand, they don't check exactly. There was an untyped form of radiation in this area after the atomic blast, but, he went off at a tangent, it isn't a porpoise? What is it then? I don't know. It's intelligent. It's trying to communicate with me. Good heavens, Black said, genuinely startled now. The look he bent upon Gresham was dubious. I know, I know, Gresham must have sensed in the silence that doubtful glance. Maybe I'm making it all up. I did spot the porpoise, but maybe my hearing's improved. The rest, well, I haven't got any proof except what I know I've seen and felt. I tell you, it's something intelligent out there. It's trying to communicate and it can't. He rubbed his forehead above the bandages, his face taking on the old look of strain. I can't make sense out of it. Too alien, I guess. But it's trying hard. Suddenly he laughed. I can imagine how you're looking at me. Would you like to try some tests, Dr. Black? Knee jerks, maybe? Come on below with me, Black said briefly. Gresham laughed again and got up. An hour later they were back on deck. Black looked worried. Listen, Gresham, he said earnestly. I don't know what's happened to you. I admit that. The encephalogram was puzzling. Your brain emits radiations that don't check with anything we've seen before. Some peculiar things are possible, theoretically. For instance, a radio isn't really likely to pick up transmitted waves, but it does and telepathy is theoretically possible. Suppose your brain has been altered a little by your exposure to the atomic blast. There are powers latent in the human mind, new senses that we know little about. I suppose you have to find new words for it, Gresham said as Black stumbled and paused. But I don't care what the scientific diagnosis is. I can see again. Not with my own eyes, but I can see. He was silent for a moment, and to Black it seemed that the blind man's whole face looked rapt, as if he gazed upon things more beautiful than a man with eyes ever saw. When Gresham spoke, his voice was rapt too. I can see, he repeated almost to himself. I don't care what else happens. Something alive and intelligent and, and desperate is near me. I can see through its eyes. Its thoughts are too different to understand. It's trying to tell me something, and it can't. I don't care. All I care about is seeing and the things I see. He hesitated. Beautiful, he murmured. All my life I've loved beautiful things. That's why you found me out here in the tropics, away from cities and ugliness. And now, he laughed a little and his voice changed. If I could see your face I wouldn't be talking this way, he said, but I can't, so I can say what I feel. Beauty is all that matters, and in a way I'm glad even this has happened, if it means I can go on seeing things like, like this. Like what? Black leaned forward tensely. Tell me. Gresham shook his head. I can't. There aren't any words. The two men sat silent for a while, 
black frowning and studying the rapt, blind face before him, Gresham staring through his bandages and through the eyes of another being at things he could not speak of. Something glistened among the waves very far away, turned over in the water, and sank again. The next morning Gresham did not awaken. To Black it resembled catalepsy. The man lay quietly, his heart faintly beating, his respiration almost stopped. Once or twice a ripple of motion crossed his features and he grimaced. But that was all. He lay for a long while half alive. But he was double alive, triply, a hundredfold, elsewhere. Around dawn it began to happen to him, he thought afterward. He felt first a something reaching out for him. His internal vision kept catching glimpses and then snapping shut again like a camera lens. There was a thought beating against a barrier, trying to get through to him. But it was too alien. It could not reach through. Gresham's half-sleeping mind could not understand. He reached out into other minds around him, seeking contact. Bird minds, sparks of life rising and falling on the winds, dim, formless bits of cloud. And other small minds in the waters, vague, weaving through green voids. But in the end, he always came back to the swimmer. And in the end, the swimmer must have realised it could not communicate, knew at last there was only one way left. It had to show him what it wanted to tell. And there was only one way to show him. So it swam down, down in the pearly light of dawn, with the sea and sky an enormous emptiness, and the albacore a small dark shape miles away, and Gresham's body hidden within it, asleep, while his mind sank with the swimmer through the fathomless seas. Down and down, into the great deeps under the atolls, where abysses lie deeper than Everest is high. The swimmer could plumb them, for the swimmer was not human. Intelligent, yes, but different. Life under the waters would follow a different course from life in the air, and cities under the sea would be very different too. Gresham had never known this feeling of bodily freedom before. He shared with the swimmer the physical sensation of motion in a supporting medium through which he could move freely in any direction. It was a strange, strong body that housed his mind temporarily, but no visual image of it formed. There were sensations of indescribable difference, a smooth, flowing, muscular thrust that exploded into bursts of action as he drove downward, and an aching, straining discomfort gradually ceased as he sank. The race of the swimmer was meant to live in the pressure of the deeps, and now the pressure began to fold in comfortingly. Once more the swimmer's body felt completely its own, and that deep sensuous pleasure made it take an intricate path downward, as a bird plays in its own element, or a dolphin gambles in the waves. The dark began to close in. But Gresham began to be aware of a new, strange light from below, an unearthly dawn in a light band no human eyes could ever see except in this incredible manner. He could never describe the colour of the abysmal dawn, a tremendous slow brightening of sunless day permeating the vastness of underseas. Shadows of the deep water swam past, shapes of terror and mystery and fantastic beauty. Once the leviathan bulk of the great whale went by, and once a goblin picnic of tiny coloured lanterns, fish with luminous spots driving in an insanely gay flight before the shadow of a barracuda that swept like death after them. But the sea bottom was dark. Perhaps only in some spots was this land of veiled shadows to be found. The immense glow of the submarine dawn drew itself in and focused on small areas as Gresham's mind went downward with the swimmer. And then a gargantuan black wall, without top or end or bottom, loomed before him. Perspective swung round dizzily, and Gresham saw that it was no topless wall, but the bottom of the sea. Crags lifted from it. Atolls and hills jutted into the faint fringes of light, crawling with weeds blanketed with undersea growth. But the great plain and the valleys were in shadow. 
anchored by glowing ropes that vanished in darkness below, swung latticed spheres of light. There were dozens of them, like shining toy balloons expanding in size as the swimmer swept nearer and nearer. Across the lattices, a troubled whirling ran, shaking vortices of darkness that made the spheres fade and brighten like lanterns, and then pulse into dimness again. The swimmer's headlong sweep, like flight through green air, carried Gresham straight toward the nearest globe. Between the lattices, an opening like a shutter widened, gaped, closed. And this was a city of the underseas. For five days Gresham's body lay all but motionless in his bunk on the albacore, while the ship drove forward over fathomless abysses, where Gresham's mind moved among mysteries. Dr. Black spent as much time as he could spare beside the cataleptic sleeper, watching the vague shadows of expression that moved now and again across his face, wonder, sometimes revulsion, sometimes strain and dread. But only the shadows of the real emotions which Gresham's mind knew far away. On the fifth day he woke. Black saw his hands rise quickly to the bandaged eyes, and Gresham sat up abruptly, making an inarticulate sound in his throat. His face for a moment was wild with dismay and horror. "'It's all right,' Black said quietly. "'It's all right, Gresham. You've been asleep and dreaming, but you're safe now. Wake up.' "'Safe?' Gresham said bitterly. "'Blind again, you mean?' And his face convulsed once in a grimace of revolt. Then he had himself under control, and his hands, which had been clawing futilely at the bandage, as if they could pull away blindness from his eyes, fell quietly to the blanket. "'What was it?' Black asked. "'You were dreaming? Would you like to tell me?' It did not come all at once. The story covered many days in fragmentary sessions, but in the end Gresham told. "'You'll find a diagnosis to cover it,' he said to Black. You'll have to decide I'm a schizophrenic, is that the word, and I'm having hallucinations. It doesn't matter to me. I know what happened. There were cities down there. He had never known true beauty until he moved with the swimmer through those incredible floating towns under the water. Our own race, chained by fetters of gravitation to the ground, never knew such wonders. Our bodies have been deformed, unsuccessful adaptations ever since we learned to walk upright. But a species without enslavement to gravity, developing in sheer beauty and sheer freedom, perfectly adapted to their green aqueous world, had come into existence underseas. They can build as they like, Gresham said softly. Gravity doesn't affect them, you see. There were houses, if you could call them houses made in spirals and coils and spheres. They can float free within the globes if they like. Some of the houses move in orbits. Some of them, oh, I can't tell you. I lived with them for a long while, but I can't describe them, and I can't tell you what the people were like. There aren't words. He had to take me down to make me understand what he wanted. The swimmer, I mean. But his city, like his mind, is too alien to tell about. I can only say it was beautiful, the kind of beauty I've loved all my life and tried to find for years. I'm going back down there, Black. Why? Black had a notepad on his knee, and his pen was moving smoothly across it as Gresham's quiet voice went on. Tell me about it, Gresham. It was the atomic explosion, the blind man said. The radiations released some sort of balance away down there, and their machines aren't working as they should any more. That's what caused those whirlpools of darkness in the light and made the lattices around the city shake. And they need the lattices. They have an enemy down there, another race or maybe a branch of their own race. It's strange to think of wars going on down there just as they have here, and one race enslaving another as the swimmers people did. I thought at first they were, well, call it evil. I saw how they ruled. Evil is a foolish word. The swimmer people are so beautiful and strong and wild, you can't apply our rules to their lives. I lived among them. 
I saw that other race in the dark of the sea bottom, banished from that wonderful strange light a human couldn't even see. At first I thought it was cruelty that kept the, the others enslaved, and then I happened to see one of the others. His voice faltered and a shadow of revulsion crossed the bandaged face. I saw what was left after a minor uprising, and I saw how the others kill and what they look like. And after that I knew. If the decision were mine, I'd exterminate them all. I can't help that feeling. It's instinct. There are things too degenerate to live. It's all been going on down there for I don't know how many centuries, how many millenniums. Think of it, Black. Empires rising and falling. Races ruling and races enslaved. Sciences developing along lines we'll never understand and nobody guessing it until the swimmer came to the surface. His race is intelligent. They must have realised the new radiations and the explosion had come from another intelligent race. They've seen sunken ships and drowned men. They knew we lived here in the air. But they're so alien. No communication is really possible between us. If it weren't for the accident that did whatever it did to my brain, no human might ever have known. Well, I'm going back. There's trouble down there. They need help. Gresham paused and laughed harshly. Why do I keep thinking I can help them? I can't even share their thoughts. All I can do is find some creature to take me down into the depths so I can see with its eyes. I can watch if I can't help. I can move through those wonderful cities again and see the swimmer's people. His voice faltered and he gave his mind up for an instant to the memory of that race and its beauty and wildness and strange alien enchantment. The swimmer himself had to stay. Gresham said. The machines, you'd never guess they were machines to see them, weren't working well. All who could had to help the machines, help to keep the dark race, the others, away from the cities. So the swimmer's mind let go of mine, and I had to come back. What can you do? Black asked. Is there any way to get in touch again? Gresham turned his blinded face toward the ocean. He was silent for a moment. That shark, he said, the big one, he's still following us. Black had to rise and lean over the rail to make sure. Yes, I can see him now, he's with us. That'll do, Gresham said confidently. An intelligent mind can control a non-intelligent one for a while. I'll take the shark's body and go back. You're tired, Gresham, Black said. We can talk about this later. I'm going to give you a sedative and I want you to rest. Gresham laughed. See that gull up there? What would you say if it circled three times and landed on the rail beside you? Black looked up. The gull sailed in one wide circle, two circles, three, and swooped down toward the rail. Its yellow feet gripped and closed and it perched there turning its head from side to side and looking at Black with eyes that fantastically seemed to him for a moment Gresham's eyes, as if the blind man in the bird's dim brain looked out and saw him. Gresham laughed again. You've got a notebook on your knee, he said. You have no idea how queer you look through a bird's eyes, Black. All out of focus and strange. Let it go. Black said in a choked voice. The gull tipped forward and spread its wings, its eyes going blank again with mindless bird thoughts. Yes, Gresham said. The shark will do. Black sat beside the bunk and watched the sleeping face of the blind man, his own mind in a turmoil. He could not believe or accept Gresham's story, but in spite of himself, he found images slipping through his brain as he saw emotions flicker across the cataleptic face. He saw the green abysses gliding by, he saw the nameless undersea dawn brightening in the depths, felt the great shark's body bend its banded muscles and drive on and on toward a city of floating spheres that illuminated the dark like lanterns lighted by no human hands. Suddenly Gresham sat straight up among the blankets. The blood rushed into his face and he said, Ha! 
in a choked, inarticulate voice. Gresham, Black said, laying a hand on his arm. Are you awake? What is it? He was not awake. He did not turn his head or feel the hand or hear the voice. All his faculties were focused on something very far away, deep down in the abysses beneath the boat. He was like a man in a nightmare. His breath came fast now through bared teeth, and his face convulsed into the lines of a man fighting for his life. The dark, he said thickly. The dark. Where did the lattices go? What's wrong? Oh, what's happening here? But that was the last articulate speech he made, and the last words Black had time to hear, for suddenly Gresham began to struggle violently with the blankets, striving to throw them off, lashing out with clenched fists whenever Black tried to hold him. In the end they had to strap him to the bunk to keep him from injuring himself and those around him. He lay there struggling furiously, resting in panting silence and then fighting against the restraining bands again. His face was wild with a ferocity that sent cold shivers through Black's mind, a less than human ferocity. And in the writhing of his body against the straps, in the way it bowed and lashed straight again, and the strangely fluid motions of his struggle, Black tried not to think he saw the movement of a shark's body fighting in deep water against an alien foe. Blood, Gresham muttered deep in his throat. Blood. So much blood. Can't see. But there's another. Kill. Kill. Kill them all. And it seemed to Black that the little cabin was dark with the dark of the undersea, and blinded with blood that spread through the dim water, and boiling with the terrible combat of an unknown struggle. He knew to an instant when the shark died. He could tell by the last spasmodic convulsion of Gresham's body on the bed, the double lashing motion, and the sudden silence. He even thought he saw for an instant the blankness of death itself flicker across Gresham's face, the brush of it touching the edges of the mind that had controlled the shark's mind. After that, there was only silence and the slumber of deep exhaustion. It was too late, Gresham said. His voice was a whisper, hoarse from the shouting he had done through his nightmare. His body was bruised from struggling against the straps, and his mind was sick and tired. It must have been too late from the moment the explosion went off, if anyone had known. But they still hoped. They sent the swimmer up and they brought me down, hoping until the last I could do something. He laughed briefly, a croaking sound in his raw throat. I might have known it was too wonderful to last. The cities and the people, they were never meant for human eyes to see. I was lucky to get even the one glimpse I had. And maybe it's just as well. The two cultures never could have met. If there were any way for humans to reach them, we'd only have destroyed their culture as we've destroyed everything else that's beautiful. As we'll destroy ourselves when the time comes. We did destroy them, Black. The explosion did it. And maybe this was the best way quick enough after all. But what was it? What happened? The face beneath the bandages was grim. I went down with the shark. I could see from a long way off that something had gone wrong. Only a few of the cities were lighted, and one of them flickered out as we came near. And in the underwater dawn light I could see black shapes shambling. If it hadn't been for the dark people, the slaves, I think they might have won. They were getting the machines under control again, you see. In the last city the machine might have held out if the others hadn't already been in the city. I made the shark swim closer, in through one of the dark cities where I'd gone with the swimmer. Once it was full of lights and spiral dwellings, beautiful, lithe people gliding among the floating orbits of their homes. Now it was dark. I couldn't see much, thank God. But the black figures shambling through those hollow cities among the floating bodies of the beautiful dead swimmers horrified me. Gresham bit his lip and was silent. After a while he went on. 
there was still fighting going on around the last lighted place. I made the shark swim to it. I could help at least that much. The swimmers fought with curved blades of light that slashed through everything they touched. They were wonderful fighters, terrible and wonderful. I never saw such ferocity and such beauty. But the others were too many for them. His voice cracked for an instant. The others were foul, degenerate, dark things, he said and choked over the words. Here, drink this, Black commanded, holding a glass to Gresham's lips. Gresham drank and rested for a moment. That was all, he said presently, in a calmer voice. I watched it end. I helped as much as I could, he grinned faintly. It was one of the swimmers who killed the shark finally. They didn't understand, of course. They must have thought it was just another of the scavenger fish who were gathering because of the blood. The curved light blade sheared through it like steel, or fire, fire under water, and the shark died. Well, it was time for me to go anyhow. I'd done all I could then. But this isn't the end of it. What do you mean? Black demanded. Then he said quickly, Never mind. You've got to rest now. You can think it over and tell me later. I don't need to think. Remember what I told you when I first saw the others? How hateful they are even on first sight? Instinct, Black. Sheer instinct tells you to kill them on sight. I, I don't know why, but that's what I'm going to do next. He clenched his fist and struck the blanket lightly. Extermination, he said in his hoarse, strained whisper. Extermination. A week later, the albacore passed a group of tiny islets lying like scattered flowers on the water. Native outriggers came out, as usual, to offer fruit and gossip. Gresham seemed to know them. He talked briefly in Kanaka, and there was much nodding and liquid chatter among the natives. When the outriggers went back, Gresham went with them. I know what I want, he told Black as the neurologist helped him over the rail. I'm all right now physically, or as much as I'll ever be. I'm a responsible man, you can stop worrying about me. I've even got enough money put aside for what small needs I'll have from now on. Forget about me, Doctor. And thanks, thanks very much. Doubtfully, and with a touch of strange, illogical envy, Black watched him go. The globes that once swung glowing on their cables in the abyss swing dark now. Below them the night land of the sea bottom stretches far away into a light that shines eternally, a light no human eyes will ever see. Inside the cities which are tombs now, the beautiful bodies of the dwellers float, hollow-boned bare skeletons cleansed by the wandering denizens of the sea. The dead race lies forever entombed in its dead cities. But a race still lives among them for a while. A dark alien race that destroyed its masters and shambles now among the ruins it made. Death lives with that race. Out of the immense ocean dawn above, the ravening sharks come down silently, one by one, to kill and kill and be killed and on an island high over them, in the daylight he cannot see, a blind man sits on his beach with his strange sight focused in another world. A world of water, and darkness, and death. He is not blind as other men are blind. He has a thousand eyes to see through. He had a vengeance to wreak. Some day that vengeance will be sated, when the last dark shambler dies. After that, Gresham will be content. He will give up his days, then, to looking at the world again through the strange small lenses of other brains, and to the memory of beauty which he once saw so briefly in the hour of its destruction, and will never see again. In comparison to the memory of that beauty, all other men are blind. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more every Monday and Friday. 
and to support me even further, consider signing up to my Patreon. You'll get exclusive novelettes every month by the best authors, including ones featured in this compilation. For example, Trouble on Titan by Henry Kuttner, The 64 Square Madhouse by Fritz Leiber, and The Chapter Ends by Paul Anderson. Plus many more. So head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff to get started. Next up on YouTube, you can find my collection of five bleak and brooding sci-fi short stories by clicking the link on screen now. <laughs>